Gregory and, of course, Carlos for the invitation, and more generally to thank the, uh, the European Association of, sorry, I don't know the correct name, but uh, <laughs> for putting in place this, this network of conferences. It, it's, a, it's a very interesting idea. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about some work uh, that we've been doing in my group in the last few years, modeling um, chemical reaction mechanisms. And so a lot of, a lot the, work of the work that we that do, that we do involves, involves qualitative, qualitative modeling, modeling reaction, reaction mechanisms. mechanisms. And, and I want to give one recent example, example of this without, without giving too much detail. detail. This, was this was motivated, motivated by, by a collaboration with an experimental, with an experimental colleague, colleague. Um, um, where, where we observed, we observed with, with surprise, surprise that the, that usual, the usual substituent, substituent effect, effect on nucleophilic, nucleophilic substitution, substitution whereby, whereby electron, electron withdrawing, withdrawing groups, groups tend, tend to accelerate, accelerate SN2 substitution, substitution was, reversed was reversed in these, in these reactions, reactions <laughs> where, you, where you, um, um, where you, where form, you a form a three-membered three -membered ring. ring. There isn't, there isn't very, very much, much on the extreme, extreme left or the extreme, or the extreme right. right. So let's, so let's just pick one, one and then, and then hope, for, hope the for the best. I'll shout if there's a big problem. Um, where here we found experimentally that electron withdrawing groups made this reaction slower. And this was a little bit puzzling, so we looked at it computationally. It turns out that computationally, if you study the intermolecular and intramolecular versions of this reaction, you indeed find in the intermolecular case that electron withdrawing groups make the barrier lower, whereas for intramolecular reactions, the electronic withdrawing groups tend to make the barrier higher. So that explains the effect, but we could also, sorry, it reproduces the effect, but we could also explain it in a qualitative way um, uh, associated with the electronic interactions that are occurring in the transition state these are electrostatic effects. And what we discovered is that when the nucleophile approaches in this um, typical canonical SN2 geometry, the, uh, this, this effect is such that you, you get the normal trend. But in the very weird geometry that is enforced when you're forming a three-membered ring, this effect disappears and you get um, destabilization of the transition state by electron withdrawing groups. Now, it's my view that computational chemistry is really useful for studying mechanisms in cases like this, where we can get qualitative insight and an explanation for how things happen. I like very much this quote by Eugene Wigner, which I think is an important part of computational chemistry. We don't need to just reach the stage that the computer understands what's going on, that the very complicated calculation reproduces the experimental observation, although that's already important, but it's also nice to translate this into qualitative concepts that we can then use further. I was inspired, actually, in part by Clemence's talk to um, expand on that idea of getting qualitative understanding uh, and even quantitative understanding of substituent effects. And I, I, I was really, it was a very nice talk. And what I like about it is I see that it emphasizes the concepts, understanding what's going on. I, I just wanted to say this is something that's been going on actually in different ways. Here I'm doing what old people always do. They say, you know, this was already done 15 years ago. And I wanted to, to underline, for example, this very nice paper by Vida Jensen from about uh, 10 years ago, where he, just like Clemence did, used thermodynamic data as a proxy for reactivity to build a structure activity relationship for the effect of phosphine ligands on olefin metathesis in, in, this, in this very nice paper. In fact, this kind of thinking even goes back much further to people like Bill Tolman, who looked at ligand effects using quantitative spectroscopic or thermodynamic properties to correlate with reactivity. We did quite a lot of work in this area ourselves some years ago where we were trying to develop a so-called ligand knowledge base where for some three or four hundred ligands, we try to correlate calculated properties with, uh, with reactivity. So here, for example, is an example, uh, is a study where we were looking at activity of a variety of phosphine complexes uh, in some transformation. I think it was a Suzuki coupling. And here, each of the ligands is plotted 
in terms of the principal components of um, their properties. And the color of the dots, the white dots are ones where there's no experimental data, and then the color of the dots gets more intense as you get more activity, showing that these two principal components correlate quite nicely with the uh, reactivity. And this is work that was done uh, in Bristol in collaboration with uh, my former postdoc and now, I guess, ex-colleague, uh, Natalie Fay. So I think this is really one of the valuable things that computation can do. It can focus not just on numbers, but also on qualitative picture. However, I now want to switch to some of the work that we've been doing uh, recently on trying to be more quantitative. And this was really inspired, actually, by um, some work that I did in a completely different area, a reaction that has already been mentioned uh, yesterday, the hydrogen atom abstraction by hydroxy radical, which is an important atmospheric reaction, um, which initiates oxidation of, of volatile organic compounds. And this is something I've been interested in for some years, and we've been trying to understand the trends and what controls this reactivity, see if we can predict rate constants for this reaction for various organic compounds. Now, this simple reaction has probably been studied computationally roughly a million times um, in the literature, maybe not a million, but a lot. And you can get incredibly accurate results by using um, very high-level electronic structure theory and sophisticated forms of transition state theory going all the way to things like MCTDH-based uh, TST. But we were interested here to see how good you could get predictions based on rather simple transition state theory. And I just wanted to show the results briefly so one of the first things that we did is we tried to calibrate the electronic structure theory methods that we were using, and we looked at the barriers for the abstraction reaction for a number of simple alkanes or volatile organic compounds using a variety of electronic structure theory methods. MP2 with this basis is not great because it gets the barrier about 25 kilojoules per mole too high. However, we found a particular density functional, which is an exact exchange heavy uh, functional, which agrees pretty well with G3. And it turns out, although it doesn't agree quantitatively, statistically, it always seems to give the barrier too low by about the same amount. And it turns out if you then use that method, you can calculate the rate constants for hydrogen atom abstraction and this was uh, in, described in these two papers. The, the graph is from, from this paper. Using simple uh, hiring transition state theory. And this is plotted uh, computed versus experiment. The red line in the middle represents perfection. And the dotted lines represent an error by a factor of three which corresponds to a, a free energy error of the order of three kilojoules per mole. And when doing this work, the, you know, which was disjoint from reactions in solution, I was thinking to myself, well, if you can do this here, shouldn't we try and do this for solution phase reactions? Um, for catalysis. And so we started to try and do better calculations for uh, solution reactions, and not just to get this qualitative insight, not just to provide qualitative explanation of substituent effects, but also to try and get rate constants, kinetic properties, accurately. I also mentioned this as an example, if you like, of, um, again, I'm getting old, so I can say this kind of thing, an example of where different research projects can cross-fertilize, and it, it's, it's always valuable to, to learn from uh, different types of computational chemistry. Uh, it can have benefits. Okay, so what, we, what we're trying to do then is to, to reach a state of predictive kinetics. We'd like to be able to calculate the kinetics of catalytic reaction mechanisms, elementary catalytic transformations, but also more complex ones, 
That means we want to predict rate constants and rates. This is difficult. We need to reach accuracy of the order of kt. Uh, and we don't just want to calculate one number. It's very often possible to get one number right because using the, uh, the famous Texas sharpshooter fallacy, where you take your gun, you shoot at the barn door, you make lots of holes, and then you go and draw a target around the place where you hit most often, and you say, that was the right one, that was the one I knew it would hit the, bull, the, um, the bullseye. If you do lots and lots of calculations, you get lots of results, and you can always convince yourself that the one that gives the right answer was the best calculation. But we like... It's harder to do that if you try to calculate many things, because it's unlikely that one calculation will get all of them right, unless it's at least roughly right for the right reason. So we'd like to um, get the kinetic order of reaction with respect to different reactants right. We want to look at temperature dependence, solvent dependence, uh, substituents, various additives. The idea of using, of modeling kinetics is not new, and, and uh, Fedu gave a nice introduction to that idea, and it's used in other areas, so I'm not going to say too much about that. The reaction we picked was the usual combination of luck, uh, theoretical considerations, and practical considerations. I had a colleague, Paul Pringle, in Bristol, who was very interested in hydroformulation. We had funding for a joint PhD student, so we decided to look at this. Also, this reaction is quite simple. So even when we started this project about 10 years ago, um, you could do quite accurate electronic structure theory calculations. So it looked like an attractive target for a more quantitative approach. It turns out it has other features which make it a good test for theory, which I hadn't thought about, but which turn out to be important. So th this is what we want to do. The aim, Paul Pringle's dream, was that I would tell him, do this reaction with a phosphine ligand with this structure, and it will have the exact correct profile of reactivity, selectivity between linear and branched aldehydes, hydrogenation of the alkene to form an alkane, hydrogenation of the aldehyde to form an alcohol. It will have the exact correct combination of all those properties that will make you a rich man. So that was his dream. We didn't quite get there, but uh, we learned some interesting things, I think. Um, some of you have heard me talk about this before. Um, for the others, I'm not going to go into too much detail. Uh, the reaction mechanism, slightly unusually for a computational study, was already known. It was known from experiment from uh, Heck from the 1960s. It was known uh, computationally from various groups, including the, uh, the Morikuma paper that was mentioned uh, yesterday, although that appeared after we'd already started our work. Um, but what was not clear was this quantitative picture. So when I say the mechanism was known, what I mean is that each of the individual elementary steps was known to play a role in the mechanism. But what was less clear was, for example, what was limiting turnover. So that was our goal. We wanted to understand that. And our immediate goal, before going on to the riches-inducing phosphines, we decided that we would model the reaction with the original catalyst, uh, which is just cobalt uh, and carbon monoxide and hydrogen, which forms this hydrido-cobalt complex in situ. And the reason we picked that is because there'd been a nice study at ETH of the kinetics of this reaction with lots and lots of data at different temperatures and varying the pressure of hydrogen, varying the pressure of CO, varying the amount of catalyst, and such like, which gave us a good set of data to test what we were doing. What did we do in this study? We used DFT to optimize structures. Because the system is fairly small, we could use canonical coupled cluster with a not very big basis set. However, very, as we started the project, explicit correlation was available, so we could get reasonable results. Uh, 
The reaction as studied by Born was done in, in toluene. We did some tests and found that toluene had no effect on the free energies or a very small effect. So we decided to leave it out for um, sort of out of a parsimony reason. We use transition state theory in its simplest form with very standard statistical thermodynamics. Um, the one thing I wanted to comment on is when we were doing this work, at least for me, it wasn't completely clear because there's lots of discussion in the literature about how you should calculate entropy in solution. And um, there was an argument which was inspired, among others, by this paper by George Whitesides. And when George Whitesides writes something, uh, it, it's good to pay attention because he knows what he's doing. And he argued that Entropy in solution varied from entropy in the, fast, in the gas phase in a, in a standard and predictable way, which had to do with the available volume in solutions. And he proposed some equations to calculate entropies in solution. And these equations basically lower the entropy very significantly. And these approaches have been used more and more by computational chemists. And we got sucked into doing this a little bit at times. Um, but more recently, uh, I have um, decided never to do this again. And the reason is we're using free energies of solvation typically as computational chemists. And free energy of solvation includes enthalpy and entropy of solvation. So what we're really calculating is we are directly calculating um, free energies in solution. At least that's what we're trying to do. Um, in this particular case, I told you that the free energy of solvation was very small, which would suggest that it doesn't capture this effect, but actually it most likely does. Um, there is most likely what is happening here, what the continuum model has been parameterized to reproduce is a negative enthalpy of solvation due to the dispersive interactions between the various molecules and the toluene solvent and a negative entropy of solution associated with this effect, which cancel out, as enthalpy and entropy so often do, to yield very small free energies of solution in this particular case. So uh, we, we don't use entropy corrections anymore. We just use the standard sacco tetrode equation to calculate um, translational entropy. Um, this is the potential energy surface that we calculate for the reaction. Um, this is the free energy surface. Uh, and one of the things which is interesting is that there are two points on this profile which are quite high and which are close to one another. And it turns out it's not easy just from inspection to know which of these is rate limiting. And that is why we turned to a microkinetic model. We actually went through some mild pain with essentially the Bodenstein approximation. However, there are bimolecular steps here. So we, we had to use pen and paper application of the steady state approximation to derive an expression for the rate as a function of rate constants for each of the elementary steps and the different pressures and concentrations. Uh, we could, the, the numerical approach that, that Felu described works fine also, it turns out. Um, I'm going to skip this in the interest of time. And um, I think I'm going to skip this also. And we got some results which we published uh, three years ago now, um, where our raw results were in slightly less good agreement with experiment than Felu, but I think they were comparable to the accuracy that we had for the gas phase reaction. So the, this is our calculations. The black dots are the experiments. We're, we're within about a factor of three in, in all cases. And as you can see, we capture this uh, non-integer order of the reaction of the rate constant with respect to the cobalt quite nicely. The linear dependence on alkene, the uh, hyperbolic dependence on the pressure of carbon monoxide, and again, this um, half integer order with respect to hydrogen. So I think our model here is roughly correct. Um, 
And indeed, it also allows us to predict one of the side products, the formation of alkane, which is an undesirable side product. This alkyl cobalt intermediate, what you want it to do as an industrial chemist is to insert carbon monoxide to form this acyl cobalt species. But it can take a side track and add hydrogen, thus forming an alkane. This is the potential energy surface for that. Uh, once you calculate all of the rate constants, you predict that with the parent catalyst, under the typical temperature conditions used for hydroformylation, you should be getting about 2% loss of alkene, which, um, which is indeed what is seen experimentally. We're looking now, and we've been looking on and off, slightly perturbed by moving to Belgium, but uh, reaching cruising speed now. We're looking at many other aspects, such as selectivity, uh, N versus ISO, and also the hydrogenation of the aldehyde to form an alcohol. And this is work that a PhD student, Eva Slapa, has been doing. And this is um, giving us much more insight into this reaction. And I think, hopefully, what I want to reach for this particular reaction is the state where computational investigation of the kinetics is actually of interest to an industrial chemist who, who cares about this reaction. And I, I think that we're, we're slowly getting there. And I find that um, very pleasing, if you like, that we can do this nowadays. Um, OK, so th this is just an example of how the uh, the simulated rates for the selectivity match to experiment. We're not perfectly there. This is some results which are a couple of months old. So experimentally, this is a time profile for the formation of the linear aldehyde. And our calculation, we're wrong by about a factor of three. And uh, for the branched thing, we're, we're, we're almost uh, exactly correct. OK. So, as I said, I think that this, is, this shows us that the computational chemistry, we've been following the right path of the community. We've developed methods that can really uh, provide some nice insight. I want to um, talk about another topic that, again, some of you will have heard me talk about, this organocatalytic transformation, uh, the, the Bayliss-Hillman reaction, the coupling of a microacceptor with another aldehyde or electrophile to form a the so-called Marita Bayliss-Hillman adduct. Um, this is a reaction which, again, I started looking at due to collaboration with an experimental colleague. And the experimental colleague wanted to have a microscopic picture of the structure of the transition states in this reaction with the aim, the dream, of becoming rich again or whatever. What he wanted to do was to design catalysts that would make it possible to make this reaction stereoselective. So you can see here, you go from achiral reagents to a product where there's a chiral carbon. And the dream was that by correct selection of the catalyst, which is usually a tertiary amine, you could get a um, chiral induction. And that doesn't work particularly well in this reaction. And he, he wanted to, uh, to change that. And so we studied the mechanism. And, and one thing that was known experimentally is that the mechanism changes a little bit depending on the conditions. And it was known that under some conditions, the reaction involved a second equivalent of aldehyde. And so it had been suggested that a transition state looking like this, where you have one equivalent of aldehyde and a second equivalent of aldehyde, was playing a role. And indeed, we found a transition state for this key step where this proton is abstracted. Uh, we also, it was also known that in the presence of protic derivatives or in protic solvents, a slightly different mechanism was followed. And we suggested, or we checked, that the proposed transition state involving a shuttle transfer of a proton uh, had an energy, a potential energy, that was close to that one which made it plausible that these two steps, um, one of them could dominate under one set of conditions and the other under the other. And this is something that we did a long time ago. I always publish very slowly, so this work was actually done probably in about 2005. Um, 
And, you know, it, 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 was, it was valuable in terms of giving us some understanding of the, the features of the reaction and the structures of the transition state. The, rea the results were, however, wrong. Um, I mean, the potential energy surface here, this is energy, including free energy of solvation, but not including the free energy corresponding to the solute, um, gave a barrier of the order of 25 kcal per mole. And using sort of back of the envelope estimates, you can see that the free energy of activation must be much higher because you're bringing many partners together in this reaction. You're bringing the nucleophile, the Michael acceptor, one equivalent of aldehyde, sometimes two, or a molecule of solvent. And it turns out if you calculate the free energy, which we didn't do due to computational limitations back in, in 2005, you realize that our predicted free energy of activation was about 60 kcal per mole. And looking at the experiments, you could estimate that the experimental number should be about 25. So not good. Um, and I was sort of aware of that in, in 2005 and decided to look at this reaction again when correlated methods um, started to become applicable to these larger systems. And we actually used um, the Molpro version of local couple cluster theory and found that this barrier indeed drops quite strongly by about 30 kcal per mole uh, with couple cluster theory compared to B3lib. At first, I couldn't believe it. Then I noticed that dispersion corrected B3lit was doing the same thing. I realized that if you bring lots of things together and you're not describing dispersion, you can get big errors. So the, the, the main factor here was um, B3lit is terrible, which I guess we, by now we all know. Uh, but still, we didn't have quantitative agreement with experiment. And more recently, um, Dan Singleton published this very nice paper where he added lots and lots of experimental insight into how this reaction works. And um, the experiments, I think, are really valuable uh, for, for this reaction. The, I, I saw Walter shaking his head there in despair or something. Um, because many of you will know, it's also a computational paper. It reports new computational results. And it, it, it argues that the computational results are junk. This is a quote from the paper, which I'll let you read. And to an extent, this is a, this is a correct statement. I mean, the computations are wrong. They have a tendency to predict the incorrect mechanism. And the predicted barrier for the correct mechanism can easily be wrong by, by more than 10 kcal per mole. And the free energies that were determined experimentally for many of the intermediates and transition states along the way were likewise wrong. So again, when you get old, one of the advantages in such a fast-moving field as computational chemistry is that you can go back to your old results and try and understand what's going wrong. And I think this is valuable. So we, we decided in collaboration with another group who'd worked on this reaction to look at it again and to see if we could do better. So back in 2007, we were using B3LIP with a solvation free energy. We weren't using free energy corrections. We certainly weren't using dispersion corrections. Um, but nowadays, we can. We have access to, to reliable couple cluster energies. And so, now, for our intermediates, we, we'd use an expression like this to, to look at the free energy profile. And once you write the equation like this, you realize why this is hard. Because it turns out, even the, the, the Molpro couple cluster theory leads to, to problems here. And the, the Orca, Nesa, and Co. couple cluster theory is, is, um, is more applicable, in my view, to chemical reactions like this, because there are subtleties to do with the restrictions on excitations, which, which map out better in this version. So this we can nail, and I think this we get to within about 1 kcal per mole. But it turns out this quantity varies by more than 30 kcal per mole across the reaction. And we have uncertainties here with how we calculate this. Not big ones, but enough to change free energies by 2 to 3 kcal per mole. We also have uncertainties here on the solvation free energy. And 
This makes it quite hard to be quantitatively right for this reaction. If we use sort of off-the-shelf modern computational procedure, we use careful conformational sampling to find the lowest conformation of each intermediate and transition state. We use couple cluster energies, uh, well um, chosen free energy corrections. Our typical error with respect to the free energies measured by um, Singleton is about 4 or 5 kcal per mole, which I think it's less good than my benchmark gas phase hydroxy reactions, hydroxy radical reactions, but I think that's okay. Um, it's enough to give us qualitative insight into mechanisms. It's enough for us to know that indeed there are two mechanisms that might be relevant, uh, even though it may not allow us to predict which one is correct. We did worry about whether the solvation models were accurate enough because at one point in this project we were using um, a different type of local couple cluster theory, so some of our errors were more like 10 kcal per mole. So we decided to test the continuum solvent models that many of us use. And we did that using the, the Jorgensen approach to, to free energy perturbation, where you basically transform a reactant to a product and then use this free energy perturbation expression based on a simulation in a, to a number of steps along the transformation to get the relative free energy of solvation between two points, then add them all up to get the overall free energy of solvation. You get results a little bit like this. This is the, free energy, the relative free energy of solvation of reactants. This is the products. We can do it forwards. We can do it backwards. Hopefully we get the same number, which here we do. And it turns out um, this was great fun, uh, but it was also a little bit of a waste of time because it turns out things like SMD really work quite well, especially for non-polar solvents, sorry, non-protic solvents like THF. Our sort of maximum error was of the order of 2 kcal per mole. With methanol, it was more like 3, 4 kcal per mole. But this does mean that Unlike hydroformulation, where solvation doesn't play any role, um, we, it's not just about coupled cluster theory. We also need to worry about SMD for reactions involving very polar intermediates. And that's why even after doing this, you know, some of our results get a little bit better, but others get a little bit worse. I think we're dealing here with error bars of 4 or 5 kcal per mole, which are, which are difficult to, um, to compress too much. The huge amount of work that we did revisiting this reaction and testing every single aspect of it was done by a very skilled and hardworking postdoc, Jen Liu, who's now back in, in Shanghai. And we did this work uh, together with, um, with Sunosh Ranagam. My time is nearly up, and so I'm going to suggest that I stop at this point. Uh, so this is Jen, this is Eva who's been doing the more recent work on the uh, hydroformulation. These are some other group members. Uh, Scott showed us a photo of sunshine in England which when you looked a little bit closer involved a grey sky. This is Belgium and there are shadows, so there is sun in Belgium. And I'd like to thank uh, the EPSRC for funding some of the older results and KU Leuven and FWO for funding the new one. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Jeremy, for this very interesting lecture. So it's time for questions. Um. Thank you very much. Uh, I think I never... okay. uh, thank you very much. It was very interesting. Could you please go to very first slides of your presentation? I have. One very technical and no first next no 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 for, for, yeah, not not I think previous ah here 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 yeah 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 uh, what is uh, I have a sacramental question for for this slide what is along the axis okay so I, I said it but didn't show it on the slide so what we did here in this work is we calculated many properties each point on this 
plot is a different ligand. Mm -hmm. We calculated all sorts of properties for these ligands, like proton affinities, bond energies to various organometallic fragments, size, all sorts of stuff. And then we carried out principal component analysis of ah. this data set. And, and these are, are the, two the two first principal components of, of this analysis. Are cannot be attributed to anything significant. So well, they are not contributed by 90% by something. So, as usual with principal component analysis, you just get a vector, yeah. and you can look at it, and you can try and understand what it is. And it turns out, interestingly, whenever you do this, you find out that Bill Tolman, sorry, not Bill Tolman, that's a different Tolman. Tolman, Tolman. the great Tolman, Tolman, knew what he was doing. Because one of them often turns out to be something like an electronic Tolman yeah. parameter, and the other turns out to be roughly a steric uh, Tolman parameter. Roughly. Yeah. But not exactly. And, and then a little bit to, to the beginning. Ye more. More, more, more. Oops. Yeah, here. Uh, so you say here that this is the uh, electrostatic contribution which div makes difference between the uh, intraspheric and, uh, and I intramolecular and uh, intermolecular. intermolecular. Yes. But, uh, well, uh, the electrostatic is distance dependent and uh, the distances are almost the same. Yeah, so this is, you know, like a number of things Thank in my you. talk I showed but didn't explain. So what I'm showing here is this is the position relative to the nucleophile that this carbon occupies in this TS. And then if we take this intramolecular TS and chop it and do the same calculation, this carbon is there. And this shows the electrostatic potential. This point, relevant for the intermolecular attack, involves a point of very low or high electrostatic potential, a very nucleophilic place on the nucleophile, whereas here, due to the sterics, if you like, the, the interaction is much less attractive from the electrostatic point of view. So it's a stereoelectronic effect whereby the nucleophile is not able to show its full colors as a nucleophile, if you like, due to the intramolecular <coughs> constraint. So we still have time for a couple of questions. So Walter, then it's your closer now. I just have a comment on the Singleton paper. I mean, I agree with everything what you said scientifically on that, but I felt that's why I shook my head. The paper was extremely unfair because in 2014, Singleton should have known that dispersion was not included in the earlier work and it was well known the order of magnitude of corrections. And so he put up a straw man to put down theory and I think this is something that we should not tolerate. Yeah, look, we could have a long discussion about the tone of the paper. The fact is, we published results in 2007 which were very wrong. Um, and that's interesting. I, I don't feel particularly guilty about that, but I find it interesting. Uh, and I, you know, it, it makes you worry about whether the calculations you're publishing now are wrong. Uh, I think they are less wrong than they were 10 years ago, but I didn't think they were that wrong 10 years ago, so. <laughs> yeah, well, he, he would say that he did, because he included B3LIP for historical relevance, and that he also included things like M06, which are somehow dispersion adapted. But as I say, we could have a long discussion about that. I think it's an interesting paper. And the experimental part is very valuable for anyone who, who wants to know about this reaction. So we had another question then. Hi, Jeremy. Um, just a quick one about the implicit solvation uh, discussion. So I think we agree that through the parameterization, you should essentially capture the change in entropy from going from gas to solution. But because obviously there's no temperature dependence to that correction, presumably therefore, if you apply SMD corrections 100, degree, 100 degrees away from the temperature of the parameterization, do you, do you see worse performance? Uh, well, I, I haven't ever really tested that. Um, people who develop continuum solvent models, in fact, for example, uh, Chris Kramer, I've asked him the 
question in your presence would say, well, there's nothing stopping you fitting SMD at 20 different temperatures. Uh, what stops you doing that is there isn't really enough experimental data to do that well. But in principle, you can do it. And then there's no fundamental reason why this cannot be temperature dependent. It's just that in practice, it's not. Okay, so thank you. Jeremy, please uh, join me thanking Jeremy for this.